Order. May we have the roll call, please, Edna? Commissioner Christensen? Commissioner Newman? Oh, here. Commissioner Westman? He's muted. Commissioner Westman, you're muted. Sorry, yes, I'm here. Commissioner Wilk? Here. And Chair Ruth? Here. Okay, thank you. All right. Good evening and welcome to the Capitol Planning Commission meeting tonight. Uh, once again, we are not physically present and it's not open to the public, but we are online and the meeting is via Zoom. There are several ways you can join the meeting, which are displayed on the screen. So you may call, you can enter the webinar, and if you do, raise your hand. So uh, we have a couple of public hearings tonight, and if you're interested, uh, that's how you join. So with that, we'll get along with the meeting. Uh, Katie, are there any additions or deletions to the agenda? Um, I, I think we need to take... Uh, you must be on mute also. Um, I think we need to take a one step back to do the Pledge of Allegiance prior to oh, uh, I'm sorry. getting into oral communication. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, well, the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, now we can get to oral communication. Katie, any additions or deletions to the agenda? I did not see any additional public comment come in and there's no changes to the agenda this evening. Okay, thank you. Okay, that brings us to public comments. This is for uh, communications from the public or anything that's not on the agenda tonight. And so we're just requested to sign in and uh, if you have anything to comment on that's not on the agenda, now is the time to do that. So we'll wait a few seconds to see if anybody wants to join in here. It doesn't appear we're having anyone join the meeting for comments that aren't on the agenda. Hi. That brings us to commission comments. Commissioners, any comments? Uh, I have one. Susan? Yes. Uh, last night I watched the community meeting that um, Supervisor um, in the first district had on the Kaiser Hospital. And um, I'm quite concerned about the traffic impacts on Capitola, particularly at the Gross Road intersection. Uh, I think that ultimately this is going to have some impact on how much and what kind of development Capitola is going to be able to do at the mall without that whole intersection being, a uh, whole interchange being redone. So I would just like to ask staff to follow that for us and keep us a bit informed uh, about what's happening uh, with the traffic part of Gross Road on that project. I've, uh, Susan, I've contacted the supervisor requesting that they open 40th Avenue. Uh, it is one of the possible recommendations in the EIR, and uh, he appears very reluctant to consider that. But I think at some point the city should possibly even embark on some legal action to force the county to open that to relieve some of the traffic pressure on the Gross Road intersection. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. So perhaps we Just should... as a follow-up, um, we did submit comments to that effect uh, when this first opened up, and I'll keep an eye on it and see it as it moves and keep you updated. Great. Yeah, but if, Thank you. Katie, if we could convey to the council that perhaps a lawsuit should be considered to force the county to open 40th Avenue to relieve some of the pressure, I think that would be appropriate. I'll, I'll discuss that with the management. Thank you. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, any further commission comments? Hearing none, we'll bring it back for staff comments. Do we have any comments from the staff tonight? I do um, have one comment. There's been um, a number of new bills that have come through at the state level. I'll be working with our city attorney and putting together, um, going through and seeing exactly what we're going to need to do to be prepared come January 1st. And I plan to bring a presentation to the planning commission on the new bills and what we'll need to be working on in the near future. So just wanted to let you know that's uh, on the horizon and hope uh, I'll, I'll shoot for the next meeting, but definitely prior to the end yep. of the year to give you a full update on what, what needs to occur within our municipal code and major changes as i'm sure you've read in the paper with sb 8 and 9 um, uh, and changing the the future of single family residential development and allowing for duplexes and fourplexes within single family zoning so i'll i'll bring you up to speed and i actually have a memo that i'm going to send out to you this week so thank you okay yeah, they've been very busy in Sacramento trying to take away our local control. Okay, that brings us to item three, the consent calendar. Tonight we have one item on there, 1500 Wharf Road, and it's a sign program for Venetian Court. And that item is going to be continued um, until our regular meeting on November 4th. Do you have anything to add to that, Katie? I believe um, Commissioner Newman may have to recuse from that decision. I think that's, is that correct, Sean? Okay. But just for proximity. Yes. Okay. So do we have a motion to continue this item to November 4th? I'll make a motion. This is Commissioner Westman. Commissioner Wilk will second. Okay, we have a second by Commissioner Wilk. Uh, may the roll call please, Ed? Commissioner Westman. Commissioner Westman. Did you say Westman? Yes. Commissioner Newman. I abstain. Commissioner Wilk. Aye. Yes. And Chair Ruth. Yes. The motion carries and that item, the sign program for Venetian Court will be continued to November 4th. That brings us to our public hearings tonight, which we have three, I'm sorry, four. Uh, our first item is 1425 49th Avenue. This is for an approval for new construction of a single family home with an ADU at the corner of 49th and uh, I believe it's Opal Street. Sean or Katie? Uh, that's correct, and uh, good evening, Commissioners. Chair Roof, mm -hmm. before you is a application that is, proposes to demolish an existing cottage and construct a new 1,391-square-foot single-family residence with a 446-square-foot attached accessory dwelling unit, or ADU, located at the corner of uh, Opal Street and 49th Avenue, 1425 49th Avenue. The application includes a coastal development permit and design permit, which both require planning commission approval. The corner lot, as it appears today, surrounded by one and two story single family homes in the Jewel Box neighborhood. The adjacent vacant property at 4875 Opal Street, seen in the background, is a separate legal lot that is owned by the same party. That site was approved uh, for the construction of a single family residence by the Planning Commission this past July. The four plans can be seen here. The area shaded in blue on the second story represents the ADU living space, which can be accessed from either the primary dwelling unit or uh, from the exterior by a private second story deck and exterior staircase. The proposed ADU is located on the second story and is therefore subject to full review standards, including floor area ratio. Combined, the two units total 1,837 square feet for a maximum floor area ratio of 57%, which is within the allowed range for this lot. The elevation seen here. Uh, 
the primary residence and attached ADU utilize horizontal siding, gabled roof ends, and traditional rafters and braces, along with a composition roof. The primary dwelling includes a second story deck facing 49th Avenue. The uh, seen here are the two proposed trees uh, along Opal Street. They're coast live oaks and would meet the requirements for 15% canopy coverage on lots with new development. This is the site plan uh, along with the highlighted parking plan with parking spaces installed shaded in blue. The project requires three parking spaces, none of which need to be covered. The applicant has proposed three spaces, including two uncovered spaces and one single car garage. The maximum allowed width for parking areas within the front or exterior side setback area is 20 feet. Proposed configuration, as seen here, uh, from end to end of the two parking spaces, measures approximately 41 feet wide, which exceeds the maximum allowed width and therefore requires an exception by the Planning Commission. The Planning Commission may grant an exception to allow a larger parking area if they find that the proposal incorporates design features that minimize visual impacts to the neighborhood. The exception is not a variance or minor modification and does not have requirements or findings beyond the section shown above. The applicant has proposed semi-permeable pavers for most of the parking area with turf grid center strips in front of the garage and under parking space number three, which you'll see in just a moment. The applicant has also proposed landscape improvements on the property within and within the fronting public right of way, which include plantings and a 30 inch tall fence. Staff notes that the parking layout shown on the landscape plan is inconsistent with the site plan, including one space that is not contained on entirely on private property. A corrected layout, as shown above, would reflect the parking configuration on the site plan, but it would place parking space number two on top of turf and other landscaping not typically used as a vehicle uh, bearing, and, uh, which the staff does not believe meets the spirit of the code. Staff has added a condition that requires the applicant to revise the site plan and landscape plan changing parking space number two into a ribbon style parking space with parallel parking strips and low ground, low growing ground cover in between. In addition, the planning commission could condition parking space number one to utilize a ribbon style parking space as well. With that, staff recommends the planning commission either approve the project as conditioned or continue the item and require the applicant to modify the parking layout on the site and landscape plan. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Are there questions or comments for staff before we open the public hearing? Uh, this is Commissioner Wilk. I have a clarification I'd like uh, Sean to address. And that is um, on the landscape plan, or um, view where they show the um, the cars, um, basically one, two, three. Um, you're saying that that is not acceptable because the uh, uh, if you go if you go back to the, could could you just go back to that landscape plan real quick? Sure. Uh, well, the landscape plan doesn't show number two there it shows it's parked right behind number three right there so and you're saying the reason that that is not acceptable is because as shown that car actually pokes out beyond their official um lot line is that correct that's correct the the space in between the building and the property line 
is insufficient for a full parking space. If they wanted a configuration right there, it would actually require variance. And, and is that, so that lot line, that, that's kind of unique for this property, isn't it? I mean, to have it so far away from the street edge? If that's one thing that staff noted is along 49th Avenue, the, the public right of way, and in this case, un, an unutilized right of way is uh, deeper than on many other areas in similar lots. That's correct. Okay, thank you. And just to be specific, it's 14 feet um, from the property out to the curb and gutter. And typically we see about 10 feet um, in areas like Tupo Hill of unutilized right of way. Have, uh, have you determined how many other homes on that street encroach into the public right of way for their driveways? Okay. I think there's quite a number that have that same issue. Uh, are there any other questions or comments for staff? So hearing none, we'll open it to the public. And now is the time for any concerned parties to address the proposed development of a single family home on 1426 49th Avenue. Okay, we so have we'll the applicant's yeah. representative, Dennis Norton. And Dennis, okay. Dennis. I'm here. Dennis, you, are you there? Hear me? Yeah. Go ahead, Dennis. Okay. Um, if you look at the, the, the width of the parking area at 41 feet, that what that does is it, it actually includes 20 feet of that 40, of the 41, um, 20 feet of that is actually um, the third parking spot, which for an ADU, you're allowed to park in the front street. Not, that is not our, our favorite place to put it because we'd like to put landscaping across there. And, um, I think you brought up an important, uh, important point there, Mick, is that, that when you go up and down that street, that uh, the easement being that wide, almost 80% I counted of the parking, the parking in front of the garages are into the easement. So it's not an unusual feature. It, it doesn't come into the sidewalk. It doesn't come into the public area. 49th is one of the wider streets in that area, and I, I would be doubtful that the city would ever be interested in widening that street up any closer to the house than they are now, unless they want to make it a four-lane highway. Um, but uh, the, the parking can, is really resolved fairly well. It has, it has one covered parking spot. We have one to the right uh, of the parking spot in, in the, partially in the backyard. And then the one in front of the driveway. Uh, we, we placed it um, as is directed um, for an ADU where we're allowed to put it in, the, in and take it out. If we, we can take it out of the, the front easement, but we'd have to put it in the front space. And, we, we went a couple rounds on this thing, and what was asked was asked as us is that take some of the hardscape out of it, and that's why we put um, that some of that hardscape that's underneath would be like a tar it could be like a turf block uh, on that line, so it's at least green. But our pre preference is is to to have that parking spot right behind the garage, as everyone else in that neighborhood is pretty much is enjoying. Um, it's it's a it's much easier and much better in the process to design an ADU into an existing dwelling or just to have existing dwelling try and design an ADU into it. And so the project has merit in the fact that uh, we, we're, we're, getting, we're getting some extra housing here along with the, the rated house and, uh, and, not, and not taking up too, too much of the square, not uh, uh, taking advantage of a, a larger house with, with, with large square footage. And so um, the, the owners are, the owners are uh, at this point are gonna keep both houses. It's a family that owns it. And uh, that, that lot has been sitting vacant for many years and uh, we're gonna end up putting sidewalks all, away on both frontages. Um, it'll, be a, it'll be a nice addition to that neighborhood. And I don't think we're asking for anything that isn't enjoyed right now by the, the neighboring residences. And I, I may also made a count, uh, a, a, a count of, of the number of, of houses that are corner lots on that street, which are quite a few. And 60%, 65%, excuse me, of the houses, um, their, their entrance is from 49th, not from their side street. So it's a, it's a common practice when you go up and down that street for, for the driveways to be on the 49th street side instead of the side street as, as uh, we, we have designed here. I'm open to any questions, sir. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dennis. Are there any questions for Dennis? Well, I have a question. This is Commissioner Will. 
so I guess I'm a little con confused of, of, uh, of uh, uh, Mr. Norton's request here. So the staff, the staff basically wants uh, us to approve the application with the exception of uh, turning that parking lot 90 degrees. And I'm hearing the applicant say what they prefer is to is to have the parking arrangement as shown in the original landscape plan and not have that 90 degree parking uh, space at all. But that would require a variance. Right. And so are they basically requiring or asking for that variance? Can I request, can I answer that? The reason that we put the, the uh, parallel to the street parking spot was so we wouldn't have to ask for a variance. And legally we can do that. That's uh, you, you allow in your ADU uh, ordinance to allow um, parking in the front. We prefer not to do that. And I think it's, it, if I was owning that, if I owned that house, I would be parking right behind the open garage. I would not be parking sideways there. But it, we try to make it look like a landscape area as well. And that's why you're seeing a discrepancy between the landscape plan and the, uh, and the, the site plan is correct. If you look at the site plan, if, if, if Sean could show you that. I'm just trying to understand um, uh, what what the process would be if we if we if we wanted to say okay just have the the three parking spa spaces all be you know in the same line have the parking spot behind the garage actually be the one that counts and not be uh, you know not, not have to actually put this one in front of the house uh, just to meet code and um, so. Um, what I hear from staff is though that is that we could do that, but that would require a variance. And I'm just trying to noodle my way through how that would all work. If we in fact said, okay, we like get the picture as shown on the landscape plan as opposed to how staff proposed, would you in fact want that arrangement? The original landscape plan with the parking in front of the garage, not perpendicular that's a question for mr. Norton um, yeah I mean I, I think that anybody that uses that is going to park right in front of the garage because it's such a huge distance between that and the street and so really ideally you would like to have the, the area where we requested the parallel parking just landscaped area uh, yes that, that would be the best for for the, the layout on this lot it, it meets the it, it only meet, I think it's short and correct me if I'm wrong, Sean, by, by four feet of being, um, of being illegal. I think it's 16 feet now and you, what we need is we need 20 feet. And I think we're allowance for one at 18 feet. Is that correct, Sean? Uh, uh, no, that, that's not correct. It would have to be a 10 by 20. So my question then for staff would be is, is if we agreed, and I'm not saying we do, but if we agreed with with Mr. Norton, uh, and and we wanted to do that, do the parking that way, and have the landscaping in front of the front door, just pure landscaping. Uh, is there a provision in this meeting to do that, or would he have to go back and request a variance? At this point, we do not have an application for a variance, and we did not notice this item as a variance. So I would suggest. If, if that was the will of the Planning Commission that the item uh, could be continued, we could re-notice with a variance, um, but just, um, so, so that would be the correct way in which to proceed. And we do have our minor modification allowances for parking, but it, it only allows, I think it's up to 10%. So to go from a 20 foot depth to 16, it would require a variance. It would not fit under minor modification. I have, I have a question regarding consistency of our procedures. And correct me if, if I'm in error here, my memory might not be 100% correct. But I thought on Depot Hill on El Salto Drive, we approved an encroachment permit for a driveway that was too short. So the driveway would extend into the setback area. And oh, then, we had the ha then we had the house on Lincoln Avenue who construct wanted to construct their wall and we required them to have an encroachment permit because they were encroaching into the city right away. So here we have a fence that's not requiring an encroachment permit 
and we have a driveway that they're going to require a variance when other houses that we've seen haven't required the variance. So I'm just a little concerned about our inconsistency, I guess I would call it, uh, as to why why we're not allowing an encroachment per permit for this driveway when we allowed one for another residence. My recollection of the house on Depot Hill was that they actually did apply for a variance, which we granted to them, and then they got the encroachment permit. Um, the, the ordinance requires them to provide these three parking places. And so you can't make an exception from the ordinance by granting an encroachment permit. They would have to get a variance and an encroachment permit. And for me, uh, the reality of this situation is I think Mr. Norton's very correct. They're going to park the car normally where the three parking spaces are with the car parked in front of the garage. And, um, you know, they have a choice of having some paved strips in their landscape area, which can be counted as a parking place, or they can apply for a variance. And I think it's, you know, the commission seems to be making it pretty clear we would go along with that variance request if that's the way they wanted to go. Yeah. Well, you know, what would probably happen is they'll put those those parking strips in the landscaped area and a year from now they'll tear them out and re-landscape it and we're right back to where we would have been if we granted a variance. <laughs> yeah. Right. You know. So, but if, if they do it the way they propose, they sort of get what they want without having to go through the expense and delay of asking for the variance. Yeah, no, I understand that. So, and any other comments or questions? Just one well, again, more. I, I, let me go back to Mr. Norton. Uh, would, would the applicant be willing to go with a, with a variance provided that the, the, they were confident that the, that the planning commission would be willing to grant it? Is that a direction that, that uh, the applicant would want to proceed or would they just, would they prefer <laughs> us just to approve the landscape, uh, excuse me, the staff recommendation? Um, I, I prefer that it, that it be approved like we have it submitted. Um, uh, what people will do, will, they'll do. You know, they'll, they'll still park behind it, but putting a couple land straight strips in that third parking spot and making it work over there, it will become a, a landscape area more than likely. But I, I just, the, to be honest with you, and this is not the fault of staff, this is, uh, you've been under staff for, for a couple months, and um, the burden's been on the planning department to get, get this stuff approved. And I'm, this actually came into application at the same time as the last house that, I, that was next door that, that we got approved two months ago. And that the process has become very burdensome. Um, and, and so what I, what I would prefer is approve it, approve it as we have it, um, uh, approve it, excuse me, as we have it drawn now and uh, not go back to a variance procedure on this thing. Approve us and uh, believe me, these people will do the right thing and, and um, in design to make this make this corner right, um, it, it is. It, we're not asking right now for an exception because uh, you you already have approval for um, for a parking spot on the street, on, on the property adjacent to the street. That is a legal thing for you to do. Because it wasn't before, but it is with the ADU. So what you what I'm requesting is is not, not asking asking for an exception to any rule that you have. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you. Any other questions from the commissioners? If not, we'll open the public hearing to any member of the public who wishes to speak on this item. Do we see anyone, Katie? We did have somebody wishing yep. to speak with their hand up, Paula, but it seems that they've put their hand down. If they'd like to speak, please raise your hand. Paula? No, I guess her hand came down. Let me check. Um, and no, we do not have any public comments on this at this time. And there are no hands up for the attendees. So. Okay, thank you, Katie. With that, then we'll close the public portion, bring it back to the commission. Um, who would like to lead off or who would like to make a motion? 
Uh, I would make a motion to approve uh, the staff recommendation for this, approve it with the conditions and findings that are in the staff report. Okay. Thank you, Susan. Do we have a second? I'll second. This is Commissioner Wilkes. Okay. Been motioned by Susan Westman and seconded by Commissioner Wilkes to approve the application. Edna, we have the roll call, please. Commissioner Newman? Abstain. Commissioner Westman? Aye. Commissioner Wilk? Aye. And Chair Ruth? Aye. Thank you. Motion carries. Good luck, Dennis. Okay. That brings us to public hearing B. This is the prototype ADU program, and we have some designs to look at tonight. Katie? Yes. Can you see my screen? Yes. And can you see it? Oh. Let me go back. Sorry, I was having some technical difficulties tonight um, with my screen. Stop share. Well, I'll, I'll just jump in, and hopefully, um, our group that's with us tonight from Workbench will not have the same technical difficulties as that. They'll be running this next slide, the next slides. So with us tonight is uh, the owner of Workbench, Jamalai Cannon, um, and Omar Hassan, who's also, he's the project lead. And we also have Samantha Soder here. And Samantha um, is with, or is the owner of the Meta Planning Group. And she's, she is um, doing all of the informational um, packets that will come out and documents for the public on ADUs and Workbench is working on the ADU prototype. So they've all been a pleasure to work with. Um, we've gone through a couple iterations internally of their ideas and taking all the input that came in from the public. And at this point, I will um, hand it off. And I think is Omar going to present this evening or? Um, yes, hi. Good evening, everyone. Well, thanks for being here tonight. <laughs> Thank you. We're really excited to share our work so far. Um, I am going to share screen right now. And if I could just get a thumbs up that everybody's able to see the screen, the presentation. Awesome. Thank you so much. So thank you for the time tonight. We're really excited to share our progress. It's been a real pleasure working with Katie, and we've got uh, a lot of exciting things to show you all. So I'm going to just dive right in. Um, tonight, we're going to uh, run through some of the background information to let everybody know how we got to where we are today. And then we'll talk about uh, unit plans. And then we'll talk a little bit about exterior design. And so um, starting with background information, we got a lot of information from the city and uh, a lot of really helpful starting points thinking about the uh, different neighborhoods, residential neighborhoods of Capitola and sort of the buildable lot sizes for ADUs. So thinking about the average lot coverage and what space would be left over in the typical uh, lots of each neighborhood for an ADU to be placed in, we started with these dimensions. And so noting that you know the, the most narrow usable dimension was 10 feet, we used that as a starting point for the smallest unit plan and grew the units from there. So you'll see when we get into the unit plan designs that the smallest one does use um, 10 feet. And so we used um, the survey that was uh, completed by uh, people from the city of Capitola. And from that, we pulled information about ideal unit sizes, um, ideal unit styles, and sort of the design priorities as we start to think about ADUs for homes in Capitola. We also reviewed some of the current ADUs that have been recently submitted to the city, um, thanks to Katie. And um, then we conducted an internal design charrette where we started to think about our previous ADU work and the types of unit plans that we find to be really efficient and successful. We started to think about different architectural styles and um, really dug our teeth into um, the design part thinking all the time about sort of the character of Capitola. So these are precedents from the city of different unit styles and, and homes from around town and, and thinking about how our ADUs could 
sort of complement or you know live in harmony in tandem with these existing homes. And so now we'll get into the unit plan design. Um, essentially, we're proposing three different unit types with one exception, uh, a studio unit, a one bed unit, and a two bed unit. Uh, the exception here is that we have three variations of the studio plan. The idea here being that we provide the smallest usable uh, accessory dwelling unit in the studio, which is a 10 by 25 that can hopefully be used in any size yard. And then from there, we get slightly larger studio units um, with a little bit more space and a little bit more storage. And we'll, we'll get into that as we uh, go through the plans. So this is the smallest unit design that we could provide that fits within that 10 feet that we know is the most uh, likely buildable lot in Capitola uh, residential neighborhoods. So this unit is a 10 by 25 foot unit. Um, it's really tight and efficient. When you enter the front door in the middle of the unit, there is basically no circulation and you have access to all parts of the home from that, from that point. So there's a full bathroom here. Uh, an efficiency kitchenette and a space for a bed and then some millwork or built-in storage. We also have the option here to do uh, lofted storage on top of the bathroom area because we know that in these really tight living spaces, maximizing your storage space is really critical. And so um, uh, we, we also think that this could have uh, vaulted ceilings. So even though the space is really small potentially on the inside, it could have a really nice high ceiling on the inside, which will feel really good. And so when we get to the variations on this, when we bump up the unit with the 12 feet, we're then able to accommodate uh, a washer dryer in the corner. This is a space for a potential mechanical unit, depending on the mechanical design, which we will get into in the future phases. Could also be exterior storage or some other form of storage that could be used. And um, just slightly more living space, more space for a, a dining table, and even more storage along this wall. When we move up once more, we go to a 12 by 32. And in this case, we're getting to the point where you can have some kind of uh, living room where you might have a couch and a, a TV. So this, uh, the intent between these three is to provide studios of various sizes that can fit in the smaller buildable lot areas. Once we move up to the one bedroom, we start having uh, more opportunities to have some articulation in the massing. So you can here sort of see a sort of a generic mass here of what that plan looks like. In this case, we tucked the entry door around the corner. So you have a sort of recessed uh, area that kind of feels good as the front door entry to this unit. Um, you enter into the living room and a nice full kitchen here. And then um, same case, you have a full bathroom and Again, we could potentially do lofted storage above the bathroom as storage is a necessity. And then in this case, we also have a washer dryer and then a, a full bedroom with a closet. And then when we get into the two bed version, this one's slightly different than a true two bed because the intent here is to provide as much flexibility as possible. So what we're showing here is uh, sort of a flexible space where you could put an optional wall separation to make this a true bedroom, or you could potentially see this as more living space. So it could be your living room with an office, it could be an extended living room, and you could have a more generous dining area, um, or it could become you know, a full two bedroom unit with still one full bath and a washer dryer. And so with all of those, this is sort of the unit mix that we're proposing, which, which is three variations of the studio and a one one bedroom and one two bedroom, which could also be seen as a one bedroom plus in, in some aspects. And then when we get into the exterior design, part of our survey um, that we sent out, we asked uh, residents about uh, unit styles. And so we sent out this survey and we got responses back that the craftsman style, the farmhouse, and the beach cottage were sort of the most desirable in terms of what might fit in people's backyards and what might match their home's aesthetic. So keeping that in mind, with our five unit types, if each one comes in three different styles, you end up with five units and 15 design options. 
So hopefully with this like sort of small kit of parts of different unit styles, you're able to get a lot of variety in terms of exterior design and, and fitting things into your, your home. So starting looking at the Craftsman version, we're just looking at the one bedroom here as an example. In future phases, we'll, we'll do this same exercise for all the unit types, but just zooming in on the one bedroom, this is the Craftsman where we have a, a shingle base and some base trim and also some articulated windows with uh, some nice uh, trim package that matches sort of the Craftsman style. And uh, we can pick uh, a light fixture that matches the Craftsman aesthetic and uh, gable roofs with an overhang. And here we're proposing horizontal siding uh, everywhere else above the shingle base. And then when we jump to the farmhouse aesthetic, you'll see the way we're able to accomplish this is we're keeping the windows in the same location. So structurally, it is the same. Um, mm -hmm. We are changing trim packages around the windows and the siding changes as well. So in this case, for the farmhouse, we're showing a board and batten siding. The articulation on the door is slightly different. The articulation of the windows matches that farmhouse style more. Again, we can get more of a farmhouse aesthetic uh, exterior light fixture and again showing the, the roof overhangs on this option as well. And then for the final version, this is the beach cottage. Um, for this version, we were thinking that we could potentially go slightly more contemporary because I think uh, there is a there is an argument to be made that if you have a really iconic craftsman home, you might not want a craftsman look-alike ADU in your backyard, you might want something that looks pretty different from what your home already looks like. And so this is an option that provides maximum glazing. The windows are still in the same spots, but they are taller here. And um, for this instance, we're proposing no roof overhangs and really minimal trim and, and gutters. And um, also proposing like a wood look siding or, or potentially a real wood siding in this case. And so these three units are all the one bedroom unit coming in three very different styles. And we think that each of these could potentially land in Capitola and complement a home uh, very nicely, we hope. And I think that summarizes all of our work until now. I feel like I, I blew through that. So I'm looking forward to some good conversation here. Yeah, thank you, Omar. I have a quick question. Are the, the siding materials you recommend and the window treatments, are, are those readily available currently? Um, yes. Well, <laughs> that's a good question, actually. Um, uh, they're, they're readily, they're, they're mostly readily available. They're not as inexpensive as they used to be. Um, but yeah. <laughs> they're, it's kind, that's kind of the impact of most things in the building world right now. But uh, we've still been able to get hardy. The board and batten is pretty simple. It's just more expensive. And you could on the beach cottage one. You could just do, you could do vertical hardy if you wanted. You could do redwood. You know you could do any any number of looks or finishes on that. Just the intent is that it's run vertically. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any questions for our uh, presenters tonight? No, I I like what I see so far. I think they've done a nice job of providing uh, you know some standards, but with that flexibility in them so people could, um, you know, have the unit that fits more into their particular neighborhood or space. I've got a question. Uh, this is Commissioner Will. Yeah, I'm not sure whether this is for staff or for the um, presenter, but um, the idea of having the um, pre-approved designs is to minimize expense and encourage the ADUs so the applicants can come in and um, you know get pre-approved designs and then maybe since they're pre-approved um, architectural plans too that 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 would uh, that both design and construction costs would be minimized so my question is could you uh, if we would if you just approved only the footprint, the uh, not the not the external uh, finishes, but only the floor plans. 
um, wouldn't would those and you chose to do your own exterior exterior style perhaps to match your house exactly who knows you may have some sort of gingerbread thing and you would want to you match your external um, that would be okay from a pre-approved option as far as staff is concerned is that correct so I, I understand your question to be if somebody wants to opt to use one of our prototype designs but they have a different exterior siding and they want to make it match their home could they utilize the same floor plan but amend the exterior siding and I well not just siding but perhaps different uh, roof pitch or you know I don't know exactly how sure they would go but they would definitely use these floor plans you know that footprint yeah, that plumbing, that exactly, the, those details. But the external fit and finish might they might want to do it different than any of these three. And the question would be, how would staff care? I mean, would would that be just as cheap and pre-approved as as these three designs? I I think that question will come up, probably. Um, occasionally with with owners for sure so it's a great question it, depending on the uh, what they're requesting I would have to work with our building official to see exactly what would be required in order to change the plan um, but most likely for a change of the window style I think they would just need to see um, you know documentation of exactly what they're proposing the change out to be um, do you have any comments? Well, if we allow, this? yeah, if we allow variations in the style, what's the point of having a prototype? Well, that, you know, that's what I'm trying to understand is, yeah. is how that's far does the whole the prototype go? Well, well wait go a second. We've we've gotten way out of the context of the original meeting we had here, in which I have a very clear clear recollection that these were not pre-approved in the sense that they had any advantage in the permit process over any other design. It's just that people got a ready-made design and they didn't have to spend money making their own design, but it's not as though this one's pre-approved and if you have another one that's in stucco and shingle, you have to go through some approval process. They all have the same process. Yeah, they that's still my, have That was the understanding when this came up the first time. They will be building permit ready, but they have to be approved for site specificity, like to make sure they fit within the site. They'll need to go through um, sanitation district, water district, fire. So yes, they will go through a building permit, but they will be building permit ready, meaning that they're going to meet today's building code, but they will have to be approved through our, through the building department in order prior to being built. And any any changes and that to has the nothing to do with the siding or the roof pitch or the things that uh, Peter has been talking about. Yeah, they would have to if they wanted to modify any part of this plan, they would have to show us a change a, a, you know, pages that show the changes, which is something that we'd require of any applicant. I I have a question. I agree with Commissioner Newman. It was my impression that these were going to be plans that had been architecturally designed so that they would meet all building code requirements. And if someone wanted to build one of these, the advantage to them is they don't have to pay an architect, they don't have to pay an engineer, they don't have to pay a designer to design the plans. If you're going to start changing the roof pitch, then it seems to me you start getting into engineering questions, uh, you know, and other things just like you would in any building. What we were trying to do was offer something to the public that was basically um, pre-put together at no cost to them, but they would still go through the building permit process, but the building department will have already looked at these and that, that they meet their current code requirements. Yeah, that was my understanding also. I'm just curious as to 
what kind of changes can you make that triggers uh, the fact that it no longer conforms to the prototypes? Uh, I mean, can you change the siding? Can you change the window style? Uh, how much leeway does the applicant have in changing the actual style of the prototype design before it's triggered to come to the planning commission? But most ADUs don't come to the planning yeah. commission anyway. Yeah. Unless they're, they're second story, they're two story. Mm -hmm. A number of them, can, I think, can be approved administratively now. Yeah. I, I can I, answer the building department question. I, so, so if we change the roof pitch or we widen the windows or change the location, uh, you might be able to get away with the location of the window changing as long as the, the width is not changing um, because those details will all be in the set. So the roof pitch, the window locations, the door framing, all of that stuff is going to be identified in the building details. So we, so if an applicant wanted to do a steeper roof pitch or a flat roof, that would have to go back through the building department. We could pretty easily put some other details on the plan set for, say, like a stucco finish or a shingle side, like a a shingle siding so that those details are in there and if an applicant wants to use a different siding from a building standpoint we could include the details easily. Katie will have to answer what has to go through planning or what would trigger a different planning review process. So okay thank you. And, and just to be clear um, for each property you know they will be built to the standard for building code but they will still go through the building permitting process. The direction this is going uh, seems a little unfortunate to me. I think we need to be clear here that, I mean, are we trying to uh, force people into these pre, uh, these few pre designs that uh, I'm, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with them, but are, are we trying to basically have everyone have the same design because there's going to be big advantages? in the permitting process in Capitola if you use this one of these three designs? If so, I think that that's a, um, harmful to our community in the long run. And it was never what was uh, presented the first time that we talked about this grant to develop these. It was just that there was gonna be an advantage to not having, like, like uh, Susan said, not having to hire an architect and an engineer, but if it's going to be a difference between two days in the building department versus five months in the building department, then everybody's going to have to do these designs. And I think that that is more harmful than good. No, um, let me, let me clarify. Um, so if an applicant brings in an ADU design to the building department and it complies with the building code, it should be reviewed within the typical building review timing of six weeks to get first comments. Um, if an ADU application comes in for a prototype ADU, um, there's still a, a lot of work that has to happen within the building review and circulating to the public works department, planning for setbacks. So it'll get in the queue. We've just saved them time. We've saved them time in terms of design but not in terms of the review at building, at the building department. You know, there's, um, so th it, it still is site specific. There's going to be a soils analysis that takes place on each property. Um, planning will review it for setbacks and location standards, public works. It'll get routed to all the different, uh, our, you know, sanitation, water, fire. So I, I don't want it to sound like it's this, uh, a fast track through building it's not it will go in the queue like all of the others and we'll have the first review comments within six weeks that's what i understood and i think we have to be careful because it we keep uh falling into that uh trap so to speak of thinking that well if i take one of these prototypes then i'm home free and if i don't i have to deal with the bureaucracy for the rest of my life and um, I don't think that's the impression we want to give to the public that is considering an ADU. It's great that Samantha's on the call this evening because as she puts together the guidance documents, we'll make sure to be clear. 
on that point. Yeah, I'm, I'm taking notes of yeah, this conversation. You. So, um, yeah, there, th those are really good comments. And that's a lot of what my role is going to be, is outlining the process, all the different variables, uh, so people know what, what to expect. Um, and then they can make informed decisions. If they want to go above and beyond these plans, they know what that means. Or if they want to do something really streamlined um, and cost effective, they know how to make that choice to upfront. So um, I, I appreciate those comments. It's going to help my, my role very much. Yeah, I have a question. If someone chose one of these designs and said, yeah, I would like to do the farmhouse, can they get a complete set of working drawings from the city? That is uh, the outcome of this will be that these drawings will be available to the public. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Katie. Any other questions for staff? Hey, hearing none, we'll open the public portion. Uh, okay. Are there any members of the public out there that wish to address this item? We have local designer Dennis Norton. Okay. Mr. Norton. Dennis, are you there? Very, very interesting and productive uh, discussion here. In the 35 years that I've been designing housing capital, I've never used the same set of plans twice. You have hundreds of variables in everybody's backyard, the size, the setbacks, the shapes of the lot, the size of the lot. And so, Yes, maybe these will fit in partially. You know, there'll be some lots that, that are larger they will be able to, to, to put this in. Um, uh, you're not the first one to try to do this. Heen, when he was developing in Capitola, uh, if you wanted to buy a Depot Hill lot, you were going to pay um, uh, $1,000 for, for a lot on Depot Hill. And he gave you a house with it. It cost you 2000 with a house. And he had this these little square houses, which there are still some on Depot Hill, that he moved from lot to lot until somebody bought it and they would buy it and that would be their, their, their uh, 14 by 14 square house that they owned in Capitola. So th there's been a this before and, and architecture is in, in, the, in the eyes of the beholder and the designer. I think that um, the best process for this is, I like the idea of being able to give a client something like this and say, this is the type of, of project that the city city would approve of parameters but going into engineering and stepping on those bounds there won't work because there's just too many variables in, in, in a process like this and uh, uh, there's there's um, the the engineering part of it is different on every single house even the movement of a window or a door or the location of the front door which changes on every house so it, it doesn't it doesn't make sense to go into um, beyond the design phase. I think these people have given you a good start of what can be acceptable in the community. They have, I think staff has to be real clear that it doesn't necessarily make it so this fits in every, every lot. Um, if you'd like to see it, um, I've done three ADUs since the ordinance came into effect and I have two or three in process right now. One of them is my own backyard and it's more on the more modern contemporary type of design and the first plan that they showed was it. It was, it was a, a separate bathroom uh, a studio with a loft. And it's been extremely popular. You can go to that first one, the studio small. That is it right there. That is the same thing that I did. And I offered a loft in it. And you, you, you have a lot of variables, such as even the height limit. I'm not so sure that the, I'm, I'm hoping that the designers here had taken that in, in, into consideration. But, uh, uh, designing houses for for the hundreds of different variables and pallets you would have to work into, I think, um, is an exercise not worth going to. I think you, you you've done well. Stay with the design end and let 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 staff use these designs as as a, a guide and, and a uh, and a um, a pallet for um, clients that come in that are looking to do ADUs. Um, good start. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. We have, Is there uh, anyone else in the queue? Yes, we have uh, Linda Smith. Ms. Linda, go ahead. So I just want to say that I completely agree with everything that Ed Newman said. I agree with most of what Dennis Norton said, but 
you know, the, the defining things to an absolute gives me kind of a stepford, stepford wives kind of a feeling. And I would encourage you to adopt characteristics, but not a full prototype. Give people the opportunity to design something that works for their property that meets the spirit of what you want to do, but don't pin them into making it look like one of those three designs, especially if they have a modern home that they've just built. Yeah, thank you, Linda. I think they still have that option. Yeah. I hope they still have that option. Yeah, they, they do. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Linda. Anyone else out there? No, I'm not seeing public any um, public comment item. emails, and there are no hands up in our attendees. So. Okay. Okay, so we'll close the public portion then, bring it back to the commission for discussion. Anyone uh, care to lead off? Uh, I, I will. So it's my understanding that we're doing this simply to try and make it easier and more affordable for someone who wants to build an ADU in one of these designs fits their criteria. And um, we got a grant from the state who wants to make building ADUs easy. And so this is about as easy as it can get. You Again, don't have to hire an architect. You don't have to hire an engineer. The city is going to give you a full set of plans that you can use to build if this particular design fits on your lot. And it's just an attempt to save some people some, uh, some money. And for anyone who doesn't want to do one of these designs, uh, there's no requirement that you do a design uh, you know, that fits into one of these categories, you can come in with any kind of design that you want and go through the process. I mean, I, I don't think this limits anyone in any way about what they can do or design in their own ADU. I agree. It gives you an easy option if you care to take it. Anyone else? If not, uh, what is the action required on this, Katie? Uh, we were just... Did we just accept this report? We, we were hoping to get any design feedback and ask if we're on the right, if, if we're headed in the right direction, and then we'll put... I didn't um, want to have them put together all of the uh, different exterior options for each, you know, studio, each one bedroom and two bedroom. They just went through that exercise with the one bedroom. But if you um, give us the thumbs up that you're, it looks like we're headed in the right direction with the footprints and the, the different uh, materials that have been suggested, then they'll put together the full packet and come back um, and we'll just move forward with this project. It looks like we're pretty close. So any, any changes okay, that you'd you. like to see, this would be the time to tell us to, for any changes okay. with the my project. opinion I think they've done an excellent job uh, comments from the commissioners feedback yeah I, I agree I think they've done a very nice job so far and I think they ought to keep going forward I agree any comments Commissioner Newman very none then, uh, no, I was. I'm sorry, I was muted. Oh. I was just going to say we 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 received a grant for this project, and obviously we want to use that grant and proceed. Yeah, I think we're uh, <laughs> we're we're headed in the right direction here. Okay, Katie, does that give you enough direction to proceed? Yes, thank you. Okay, okay then we'll move on to the next item, item C which is the outdoor dining and design permit ordinance. Okay. John, are you taking this one or Katie? Oh, I've got this one. <laughs> Sean is going to help me with okay. my slideshow though, because my something's going on with my PowerPoint this evening. 
So Sean, if you could pull up the slides, please. All right, I'm doing that just one moment. So while Sean is pulling up the slides, um, I'll just jump in. Tonight we're going to, going to be looking at the um, a draft ordinance for outdoor um, outdoor dining, including street dining and sidewalk dining. This is we've been working closely with the city council um, since COVID nineteen since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, if you go to the next slide. So since spring of 2020, when the um, shelter in place started, the city council issued an emergency order and permitted temporary outdoor dining permits. Today, they're still in place and they're due to expire come January 3rd of 2022. Um, in this past year, we, we've continued to bring um, continuances for the temporary outdoor dining to the city council, and they've directed us along the way due to the uh, fluctuation on cases to continue to keep the um, temporary outdoor dining um, active. But last April, the city council also directed staff to develop a program for a permanent outdoor dining program. So we began work on that back in April of 2021 and first brought uh, our initial thoughts of what would be included in this program in June, on June 24th, and then got more direction from the city council on July 22nd. So the next items that I'm going to go over are just the key program elements to the outdoor dining, which we were tasked with, and how they fit within the draft ordinance that we proposed. So. Along the way, um, having learned from our recent update to our zoning code, I, I first also reached out to the Coastal Commission to see if we move forward with an out, a permanent program, what are the items that our Coastal Commission will be requesting because essentially it will come down to them in the end when we go for our certification. Um, the Coastal Commission staff initially expressed concerns with the outdoor dining related to coastal, the Coastal Act and the goal of maximizing public access and public recreation. They were, um, they suggested that the outdoor dining essentially converts public space, which would otherwise be used to access the coast into private space for businesses. Um, in follow-up meetings, it seemed that this area in, in which this, uh, their opinion was stated was a, is a bit gray. They have um, mixed, feelings about it because they also noted the benefit of having um, seating that's shared in which the public can access. So next slide, please. So in asking the Coastal Commission what they would look for in a future program, they asked uh, first that we reduce the displaced number of parking spaces that were originally permitted under the temporary program. And within the temporary program, I wanna say there was somewhere between like 55 or 60 spaces that were utilized. They also asked that the initial program um, be temporary from one to five years. It should require a coastal development permit extension after. And then um, so that there's an opportunity to, re to evaluate the, prop the, the program and see how it's been operating, make any changes that are necessary, and ensuring that it is uh, consistent with the LCP and Coastal Act. And they also ask that the funds that we take in for these uh, parking spaces be reinv reinvested into coastal access, um, including a shuttle program, coastal park beautification, coastal access signage, new bike racks, sidewalk improvements, and maintenance of existing parking. So currently, we, we did a calculation on what we pay annually in, in the village to maintain our coastal access, maintain parking, maintain our sidewalks, beach area, and it's well over $800,000. So it seemed with the money that would come in for these parking spaces, um, we would have to set up a separate account uh, for the funds to go into, and those funds would have to be utilized uh, towards maintenance and other coastal um, just reinvesting into coastal access, which we thought would 
we're already we're already spending that much more money than this is going to produce on that so that would work next slide please so one big thing to understand is because this property is um, on the city's public property we can't just put all of um, uh, the admin um, the administration of this ordinance into the ordinance itself but we also need to create an administrative policy that's really clear on how the city is going to manage this program of leasing out parking spaces the lottery system um, so I, I plan to bring to you it was not ready for your packet this week but it's almost almost there um, the administrative policy at the next Planning Commission meeting so that you can look at both the, the ordinance and the admin policy together and you'll see that the admin policy really looks at how the city as the property owner will lease the right-of-way out for outdoor dining it'll include the details for the allocation of spaces the fees and the lease terms whereas the ordinance really specifies the permit review process operating and development standards required findings for approval and enforcement next slide please Um, the City Council asked that we put a cap on the number of parking spaces right now it's proposed to be um, not to exceed 25 parking spaces within the village and to limit businesses to the parking spaces fronting their business next slide also uh, the allocation of the parking spaces in preliminary discussions with the City Council we talked of a um, a lottery system with for the 25 parking spaces breaking it down um, the draft admin policy breaks this down to say um, we'd open the application for a 40 day 45 days with a required $500 deposit per space that $500 would be credited towards the maintenance deposit if the total requested parking spaces are less than 25 then we would award the spaces to the applicants. If their total request exceeds 25, then we'd assi assign one or two spaces to each applicant and then hold a lottery for the remainder of the spaces. Um, Katie, bef before you leave that one, mm -hmm. uh, on step three, I, I, I'd like some clarification on that one. So if the total exceeds 25, how can you assign one or two spaces to each applicant? What if there's yeah. what if there's 30 applicants? So and that, also, how do you hold the re, uh, lottery for the remainder of spaces if all the spaces are requested? That doesn't make any sense. Okay. Um, well, let's say that there were 12 or, or 10 restaurants that each asked for two spaces, and then there were three restaurants or two restaurants that ask for three spaces so that's 26 spaces total um, we would assign everyone two spaces that's for the 12 so we'd get to 24 and then we would do a lottery between those other three restaurants that are each trying to get three spaces um, a lottery we put in those three names and um, you know two out of three would get their three spaces and one person one applicant would not oh. What if the total request exceed 25 spaces though, and there aren't enough spaces to go around, then how do you apply this step to it? I don't think, I would have to tally how many restaurants we have in the village that would be able to do this, but I don't think there's more than 25. So they would at least all get one, and then the lottery would be for whether or not they get a second space. So I'd like a follow up on that. If you're done, Mick, because I have a question oh. as well. So, does a parking space refer to a parallel parking space? What about all those restaurants that have vertical parking spaces? It refers to one parking space. So, even the diagonal a diagonal space would count as one space. So, I'm imagining. How, how a restaurant could make take advantage of one diagonal parking space for using for anything. Have a diagonal restaurant. So, <laughs> well, so with, what three help? chairs maybe could fit in that. <laughs> I don't know how it would work. So how, 
how are we going to do this? Are we going to let Katie make her presentation and then us ask questions? Are we going to ask them as we go through it? Um, I, I think it might be best if, if we um, go through the presentation and then look at the ordinance itself and get comments on each section. Would that, or, or I, I'm happy to stop on each slide and get comments. The allocation of parking spaces, that will be in the admin policy and maybe better to discuss at the next hearing because you don't have it in front of you. I mean, so what, what I'm hearing is that there's going to be another hearing because we don't have all the information tonight. We don't have an admin policy. We, we don't have a prototype. We really <coughs> don't have all of the information we need to make a decision. So, I mean, it makes a difference to me how, how we're going to approach this. I, I'd be happy to stop on each slide and discuss what's in the slide if, um, or at the end, um, so I'll look to you. I can either stop on each slide or at the end I can pull up the ordinance that's drafted and we can go through the sections of the ordinance. I, I feel that it would be um, almost not a, a good use of our time to go through items that are going to be in the policy without having the policy in front of you. So maybe pulling up the ordinance at the end would be the better approach. Right, because um, I, I expressed some concerns to staff about how this has been noticed, because there hasn't been any notice given particularly to the people who live and own property in the village the only notice was to uh, a notice of general circulation that went in the paper. And while I think that this is uh, ultimately going to be a good thing that's going to happen in the village, I do think it's a big enough change that um, we ought to um, uh, at least make the people who live and work in the village aware that this is all going on. And um, you know, my approach to it is, is slightly different if, if we know that there's going to be another hearing, if we're going to go to the ordinance and make a recommendation on that, then, you know, for me, I have lots of comments on details in the ordinance itself. So I'm just trying to get a sense of what we're doing tonight and which direction we're going in. I would like to bring back um, I'd like to get general comments this evening on the ordinance and bring it back to you with revisions and um, also and package it with the admin policy in November. So if, that, if that's any indicator, and I do agree with you that um, staff, will, we can definitely send out notice to everyone in the village. It's a, you know, there's a mix of uses in the village and we should definitely get the word out there because this is a huge change for the village. Thank you. So would you like to comment on each slide or shall I run through the slides and then gather comments? Let's just continue. Sure, we'll really see what slides. happens. Okay. <laughs> so next slide, please. So for Parklet Designs, um, the City Council allocated $10,000 in city funds to create a prototype design, which we're all now very familiar with what a prototype design is after our ADU discussion. Um, on this slide, you can see two prototypes. This is, these are used in Los Gatos. You may have seen them if you've been up there. Um, within how the ordinance is structured, a prototype design could be approved administratively a custom design would require planning commission review of a design permit and likely a coastal development permit. Next slide, please. Um, for fees, the, we would set the fee to, at zero for a dining deck to be reviewed. Um, there, we would not provide any construction assistance to businesses. We're seeing some cities are actually providing uh, funding to help construct dining decks. 
Um, we would charge a rent space of $3,400 per parking space per year with an annual CPI adjustment. Next slide, please. Uh, the lease term would be three years. Next slide, please. Um, so improvements in the street right of way, we would allow street dining on the streets in the village within the parking areas. Next slide, please. We would also um, allow sidewalk dining on Monterey Avenue and uh, Wharf Road. I put a picture here of also the um, Reef Dog. They've got a COVID permit for temporary sidewalk dining. Next slide, please. And for maintenance, maintenance would be subject to a lease agreement and deposit with the city. Provisions requiring outdoor dining decks be maintained and kept clean. Unmaintained dining decks would first receive a courtesy notice with elevated enforcement, including fines and removal. Cost for removal will be covered in their deposit. Next slide, please. For safety, the prototypes will be designed um, to to meet, have engineering safety measures in the, within them, and then any custom design would also have to have, be engineered to have safety measures within. This is an example of Lupolos in Santa Cruz, and you can see they have the bollards. Um, so this, their design has been engineered for safety. Next slide. And the permit review process, an administrative permit would be required for a prototype street dining deck and a design permit for the custom street dining deck. Next slide. Um, so this is uh, within, in speaking with the Coastal Commission staff, they would allow the prototype design to get a blanket coastal development permit, um, which would be issued by the Planning Commission. So once we hire a designer or architect to come up with the prototype design, we would work with them to ensure that the prototype design meets the ordinance, and then we would bring this design to the Planning Commission for a blanket coastal development permit. Um, what that means is that the design, it could, uh, once it's approved by the Planning Commission, it can be applied to multiple properties within the coastal zone. So that prototype design can be um, at Britannia Arms as well as over at Margaritaville. So that design, it, we do have a unique circumstance in Capitola that we've got diagonal parking. So we will have to consider that and work through some um, design solutions due to our angled parking. Um, and then a, a, upon approval of the blanket CDP is applicable to any restaurant to utilize the prototype design. Next slide, please. Um, and then within the ordinance, we have operation and development standards. There are minimum sidewalk widths, um, five feet in the village, four feet in other zoning districts. There are limits, um, it limits the location to eating establishment frontage only. That does include drinking establishments under our, it's eating and drinking establishments under our zoning code. Um, references to the sign regulations, currently uh, these park, the, um, Outdoor dining would not be allowed to have any signs. There are little sidewalk signs that we allow in the village, but uh, they're, they're required to be on the sidewalk. So we would have to modify the sign requirements within the sign regulations in the future should we want to allow signs on, within the outdoor dining. Um, there's a requirement for bicycle parking. Two, two uh, bicycles should be able to be parked per uh, parking space that's utilized. Um, the program is limited to eating and drinking establishments. Um, it prohibits amplified music. It establishes maximum hours of operation from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. Um, there's a, an exception for when there's an event. I can't really think of any event that would go later than 10 p.m. in the village, a special event, but we built that in just in case. Um, but that would have to be authorized by the city to extend the hours past 10 p.m. And then a requirement for trash removal and maintenance. Next slide, please. Um, there's also a standard for good standing and enforcement. So the ordinance requires that a business is in good standing with um, 
that the business is in good standing with the city with no abatement violation or code enforcement issues related to an ABC license, entertainment permit, or use permit in the past two years. Um, enforcement includes inspections, enforcement remedies, and revocation of permits. Next slide, please. Um, so with that, staff is recommending, I'm actually going to <laughs> modify this from what was in the staff report. I'd like to get input this evening from the Planning Commission on the ordinance um, and direction. I would like this continued to the November hearing or re-noticed as um, for the November 4th hearing. And um, at that time, I can bring forward the admin policy and also take a first stab on any any modifications that you would like to the ordinance if you'd like to provide that type of direction this evening. So thank you, that concludes my presentation and I'm available for any questions. Okay, thank you, Katie. Who would like to lead off? You want questions or comments? We should probably start Either, with I think. questions and then open the public hearing, correct? Because we do have... Okay. I'll save mine for the comment session. Okay. Other commissioners? I'll save okay. mine for the comments as well. Comment. Okay. Hey, I have a question. If I have an outdoor seating area down there, can I sublet it? <laughs> can I prepare food on, on site? Say with a butane operated uh, grill? No, it has to be uh, utilized by the restaurant that is in front of it, but it's something that we should make sure to include um, in our admin policy or, you know, in terms of it cannot be subletted. Okay. Okay, with that then, we'll open it to the public. Are there any members of the public out there wishing to address this item of outdoor seating uh, for restaurants in the village? Yes, we have uh, Linda Smith. Okay. And Linda, Linda, you... want to go ahead? Linda, are you there? I believe she's on mute. There we go. Am I on mute? We You're good you. now. Oh, you me. Thank you, thank you. So thank you, because I know what you guys do, and I've done it before, and I really appreciate the, um, the opportunity to come and talk to you. And Ed left, but that's okay. Um, so I'm a big fan of outdoor seating. I'm a big fan of the opportunities that it gives our visitors to Capitola to come and enjoy that whole environment. And I'm really happy to see us doing that. I'm going to skip through all of this because I sent it all to you and I hope you read it. But I have two concerns with tonight's proposal. They're simple, they're straightforward, and they have to do with the bicycle requirement and the quote unquote platform requirement. I've been around a lot and I've seen a lot of outdoor dining areas that have come through this whole pandemic with us. And the bicycle thing, I'm a big supporter of bicycle traffic, but the requirement to have two formal bicycle rack requirements per space that's being taken up is gonna be really, it's gonna clutter our streets in the village and it's it's gonna be unwieldy. So I would really like to see what kind of designs in the prototype design could possibly mitigate that concern. Otherwise, I would encourage you not to mandate that concern today or reduce it or centralize, allow for some kind of a centralized um, design. The other concern that I have has to do with the platform. And I've seen a lot of platforms in, and they've been done well where they, you know, build the whole thing and they bring it in and they set it up. And in San Francisco, in Los Gatos, in 
places that I've been, they work. But Capitola has a unique character. And I would just encourage you to make sure that the designers of the prototype take into consideration where we are, what it costs to do what we do, phase it in from an implementation standpoint so that our businesses can do it well and do it slowly, but don't mandate concrete platforms that can't be moved because you've got a lottery system and that's gonna really screw it up three or four years from now. And don't make it so that it's so complicated that they can't implement it in a manner that is in the spirit to what we have today. Because I think what we have today works in a lot of areas. And once, once staff went out and said, hey, if you're not interested, go away. And if you are interested, stay. I think we got a flavor for what could be a nice evolution for the visitor experience. And we need to maintain that. If you phase it in, don't phase it in based on number of spaces or number of people who can participate. Phase it in from how those participants can build towards whatever prototype it is that you decide meets with the permanent character of Capitola. And that permanent character of Capitola needs to be Capitola, not Las Gatos, not all the other places along the coast. It needs to be what we can do. And I think you have enough participation today. I mean, when we did the trial thing, it was two places actually had the opportunity to participate and they said it was too expensive, it wasn't worth their while and they weren't gonna do it. Today, those two places are participating beautifully in the whole outdoor dining thing and they're garnering a lot of benefit from it. Don't limit it to just those guys being able to participate in the future. Let them all participate, but phase it in so that they can. And that might mean you got to come up with, you know, what kind of barriers, what kind of stuff, um, plantings and, and how they need to dress it up and what kind of arbors they can have and what kind of canopies they can have and then let it evolve. It's an evolution, not a revolution. I request you keep it simple. And other than that, thank you for listening to me. I really appreciate the fact that I could come and talk to you. Thank I'm you, Linda. You are. Thanks for your input. Okay. Do we have any other members of the public wishing to speak? Yes, we do. We have, um, I'm not sure exactly who it is, but it's You're says, muted, Katie. Oh, Yes, the next person is just the initial A. <laughs> okay, Mr. A, Mrs. A, Miss A. <laughs> Can you identify yourself, please, and tell us what your concern is? Um, am I live? Yes. Yeah, can you identify yourself, please? Yes, my name is Mary McKittrick. Oh, thank you. And am I live? Are you hearing me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Any visual contact with anybody? And I have lived in the village on the Esplanade for 10 years. And I am uh, feeling like the whole outdoor dining program is moving in the direction of assumption that it is going to work and a lot of details based on bike racks and planning and parking spaces. I don't feel that the emergency epidemic response is appropriate for a permanent zoning change entertainment. I think we have a large population of residences in the village. 
I counted 98 private residences within 200 feet of the proposed outdoor dining in the village. Those are people that are impacted by voices, banging, clanging dishes, and use in the evenings of the tables during the dark when people are not at the beach. I have filmed and documented and logged a lot of the use in the village over time to show what it means to live here. And I think we need to back up from details and look at, does this make sense? We've all been in an epidemic. We've all been understanding and accommodating. A permanent ordinance is a whole different matter. And I'd like a chance to meet with people individually. I'm unable to show my documentations on Zoom. I'm unable to explain living in the village or going through my logs of table use parking unsafety, re residents, uh, pedestrian and bicycle unsafety. And I'd really appreciate it if we could step back and look at what we're really meaning. Does this make sense? I think to keep pushing forward like we're in a crisis epidemically isn't really logical for a permanent zoning change. I've lived in the county since 1973. I lived on in the Esplanade for 10 years. I'm retired. I know what it is to be here day in and day out. I'd like a chance to show my data and to talk about what the reality is here of including new activities in a historically represented and respected village with multi-use zoning that includes residential use. Thank you for uh, respecting the fact that I'd like to, a chance to to somehow be able to explain my my overview and understanding of living in the village. And by the way, there are 84 tables already outdoors, already in existence with ocean views on the Soquel Creek. I'm not sure this whole program is making sense. I think it was started through stress and fear and a temporary emergency. So thank you for being willing to meet with me. Thank you, Mary. Next. Okay, do we have anyone else in the public? Next, we have- Wanting to comment on this item. Austin, Austin Krager. Mr. Krager, Ms. Krager? I'm a Ms. I'm a Ms. Krager. Can okay. you hear Yes. Okay. Um, I also come at it from a bigger picture perspective um, and looking at, is this really something Capitola needs? What, what is, who's, who's the winner in this situation? I'm a former resident of Capitola and I spent 20 years in Los Gatos and I now live in Santa Cruz. So I'm really familiar with what all the cities have done with the COVID emergency and it's been fabulous the accommodations that were permitted for businesses, for restaurants to keep keep running and have these outdoor cafes. It makes me feel like I'm back in Europe. Yay, we're in California. We can have out, outdoor dining and we should. The, the bit I don't understand is how permanent outdoor dining on the non-ocean side, how that makes any sense in Capitola where from a you know visitor perspective, and also I you know feel for the residents, there's no parking already. Now you're going to take out all the parking and put in um, outdoor space on the non-ocean side that is you know inches away from passing vehicles. And I did that a few times during you know pre-vaccination. I got to tell you, it's really not very pleasant to sit out there. It's not so bad in Santa Cruz or Los Gatos, because it's a little bit different. You're not literally right on the street as much. And there's parking. Whereas in Capitola, it's almost impossible to park unless you really know what you're doing. And now that people are vaccinated, people are going into the restaurant. They're eating inside. I would venture to say 98% want to sit on the ocean side. They don't want to sit on the street. So I was really surprised when I heard that this was being considered. And I think with more and more people vaccinated, why would we want permanent 
extra spaces near the parking lot and have fewer places to park. I don't see who the winner is. I mean, will restaurants make more money? Well, that's a good thing. But I don't see it as a good visitor experience. I don't see it as a good dining experience. And there's no parking for visitors or for, you know, residents. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not understanding why this is a proposal. That's all I have to say. Thanks for listening. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Krieger. And we have anyone else, Katie? Yes. Next, we have Dennis Norton. Okay, Dennis, go ahead. Thank you. I guess I'm with you for the whole evening tonight. Um, the, uh, um, the, the villages have been in need of new vitality for a number of years. Um, in reality, our village is a giant parking lot. We, we tried to solve that by adding a remote lot that people should, should park there. They should not be parking in the village. They should park there. And we had a, if we had a decent sit shuttle system, that could be viable to, to, um, to further than it is right now. The, the, the village, the village has already has proved itself this summer. It's been the highest vitality and the best use of the village, by, mostly by visitors, not necessarily local people, that we've seen in years. The businesses have done wonderful. And the reason is, is we added outside parking. The, uh, there was a park, parklet program in the city um, a few years back. I don't know if it's still active. And the, the, the only thing that kept uh, businesses from buying into the parklet, they could have done what we're asking them to do now, was is that it was too expensive where you had to pay the full meter fee for, for all the lost revenue for the city. So they, they, nobody ever took out a permit to do that. But uh, you can look around town and, and uh, the outside restaurants are successful. Uh, most people I know want to go to the village and sit outside and most restaurants do not have uh, ocean views. Only a few do. So giving the opportunity like it's been given, given in, in the last, this last summer, it, it will be a wonderful thing, the vitality of, of both for, I, I'm saying for the residents more so than even, even the visitors to our community. Uh, one thing is, is that you can't change the level of the street at any place. You can't do, I think Linda's a little confused. They're not going to build concrete platforms out there. You have drainage that comes along those curb lines. So the reason for the platform is, is that you, you put the platform up on the curb so the drainage goes underneath it. So nobody's ever proposed to, to, to fill in spaces with that type of platform. It would be a wood platform. And most jurisdictions have done that. North Beach, um, uh, uh, Los Gatos. Um, uh, and Santa Cruz to a certain point. Santa Cruz is actually very successful to their outside dining too. And I think they're moving right now to keep it. And so it, it's a better place for people to go in our community. It's a better place for people to visit. Uh, we, don't, we don't need to have all the parking down in the village. That land is too valuable. For every, every parking space you take out of there, we'll put two, two to four people in, in the restaurants inst instead and make it more user friendly, which is, this is the first movement towards doing that. The other issue is, and, and uh, I think the problem with, with the existing setup is that it's not safe. If you've looked at, if you looked at Santa Cruz and you look at Los Gatos, they have barriers between, between the outside seating area and the road driving by. The, the area in, in, in front of, uh, of Paradise Beach Grill um, is really bad. You have people sitting there with their exhaust of the car right next to it, but there's no separation of people in the street. So one thing in the design I think is extremely important is to make it safe. And we've had an accident twice on that road there where people went off the road, uh, taking out park, parking meters. So this, this will be the best movement that this city can make to that village in a long time. And probably next to the, bringing the bandstand in there, that this is a real need in our, in our community. And if, if you want, if you want to be that village to be visitor friendly and serve the people who live here, we need to start eliminating some parking and, and p get people to, to use their remote lot and walk down to the village. And everybody is learning to do that. A lot of people are. You don't need to drive down into that village. It'll be a more scenic and beautiful place to visit. And, and remember, the village, the village doesn't really belong to the merchants down there. They are one of the owners. The other owner is the city of Capitola owns this. More land is owned by the city of Capitola and the village than anybody else. So it should be the city's decision as to how, how it's treated and how it's managed. And uh, I, I, I'm hoping you go forward with this and I, I support staff completely. And uh, it's about time. Let's, let's, let's make this village work for everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. 
Do we have anyone else, Katie? So um, we don't have any more um, people on Zoom that would like to speak, but we do have a couple written comments. Sean's going to pull them up on the screen and have the computer read the comments aloud. I think there's two this evening. I don't know if you can hear that. No, but if you look close, you can read it. Read it. That I would like to say that I don't think the outdoor seating should be permanent. I think it greatly reduces the amount of parking. It makes more difficult to, to get through the area. Capitola, there is more noises than I have ever noticed before. Thanks, Hal Barker. Thank you for that. I have one more. Is this one large enough for everyone to read? Yes. I can read this aloud for you if you'd like. I'm yeah, I, th I think it's large enough for everyone to read, Sean. Thank you, though. Everyone read it? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. So if we have no other comments, then we'll close the public portion, bring it back to the commission. Uh, we have a staff recommendation, so perhaps we should address the, uh, the issues that people have or what you like or don't like about this ordinance. So is Commissioner Newman going to start as our ordinance expert? Yeah, well, okay, I, I just have a few quick comments. Because uh, we have had uh, spent a lot of time on this, partly because some of the public presentations were a little bit uh, lengthy. Um, so one thing, Ms. Kruger brought up the fact of, of dining in the parking area and it, bring, it, it makes me recall that when I first came to Capitola about 50 years ago, all the restaurants on the Esplanade were oriented to the road. They, where, you, where you now have windows looking at the ocean, they had storage and uh, they, it was blocked off and every single one was oriented so that people were basically facing the street when they came into the restaurant and dined. And slowly, one by one, they flipped it over to where the ocean became the focal point of the restaurants. And people wanted to uh, have outdoor by the ocean and, and see the ocean. And that now we're coming full circle and we're, start, we're gonna dine in the parking lot itself. Um, I just think that's kind of interesting. I'm not saying it's a bad idea, but I am concerned about the aesthetics of it. And I know that the, uh, Katie in, in the ordinance is trying to address that through the prototypes and so forth. I think the, the Coastal Commission condition number three about applying the rent money to the uh, coastal access is a complete nothing burger because uh, we already spend 10 times that much on coastal access so we can just use that $80,000 and allocate 80000 less from the general fund. So that, that goes nowhere. But my biggest concern as this thing unfolds, and I'm waiting to see, is the lottery and allocation of the parking spaces. Because I have a hard time seeing how it makes any sense to have one parking space be, for people dining between two cars that are pulling in and out. Uh, right now, the restaurants have several spaces. 
and it's a little dining area. But if it's basically just a couple tables in between some parked cars, uh, I'm just not seeing how that's going to work and how the lottery is going to play out if everyone ends up with one or two parking spaces. That's all. Thank you, Ed. Anyone else? Susan? Yeah. So um, I, I agree. I think that ultimately this could be a good thing for the village. But I think the aesthetics of it and how it's going to work are extremely important. And we keep talking about this prototype. And in going back and looking at all the prototypes that the staff has shown at the council meetings, and most of them you see are for the parallel parking. And the main you know, dining areas in Capitola are going to be in the diagonal parking places, um, which create a whole different uh, problems that need to be solved. Um, I was actually in Sonoma this last week and they have diagonal parking and they've come up with some really good solutions and some solutions that uh, were, were very bad. So for me, I think we're getting the cart before the horse. I think we've got to have some, um, see some prototype design so we know what we're talking about and you know how this is going to work in the village and will it work with two spaces or do you have to have with diagonal parking four or five spaces to make it reasonable for it to work. Um, so I, I would like to see you know the process slowed down a little bit and, and I don't think that's a burden on anybody because the council certainly has the authority to extend the temporary dining that's going on down there right now. I think the city of Santa Cruz just extended their temporary program to December of 2022. Uh, but without information about a design, uh, how it's gonna work, how it's gonna fit in, dealing with safety issues, dealing with drainage issues, um, I, I think the ordinance is, is lacking in, in a lot of areas. Um, so I, I would like to see the city move forward with developing this prototype, at least for the diagonal parking. Um, I think there's some effort to do a, the parallel parking in conjunction with Santa Cruz, but we have a unique situation here. Uh, if you go down and you look at the parking spaces, they're not even standard sizes because of the curve and the esplanade and how it works. Um, I also had some um, uh, uh, concerns um, about uh, some of the details in the ordinance itself. I won't take up everybody's time by going through each one of those tonight. I actually met with Katie and Steve Jesberg and um, indicated some of those. Uh, one I will mention, and that is that we've lumped the outdoor dining with the sidewalk dining. And with the outdoor dining, we're saying that they need to have a prototype for it to be an administrative uh, permit. And I think we need to look a little more at the sidewalk dining because as was shown tonight, this current ordinance says it can only be on Monterey Avenue, but we have an example where it's working on Capitola Avenue at the sandwich shop. So I would like to see either some prototypes developed for the sidewalk dining or, um, you know, not have the sidewalk dining be an administrative permit. Um, uh, if someone was coming in and applying for a new business and they wanted to have that, they would have to go through the permit process anyway. Um, I just think uh, uh, we're putting a lot of faith in the whole administrative permit process. And if you look that, that process up in the municipal code, it says that administrative permits are written and approved by the city manager. So the city manager is going to be able to change those administrative policies and programs at any point in time. And I think something is critical is giving away public property or leasing it for a different use deserves some sort of public input or should at least be done in the public um, at a planning commission meeting, council meeting, not in the city manager's office. 
so um, I think we have some some work to do going forward to come up with a program that's going to be fair and equitable. Uh, right now, the way this is set up, if you're a restaurant and you've got money, maybe you can get a whole bunch of spaces right now. But for the restaurant that would want to do it two or three years from now, all the spaces might be gone. So I think we, we have to be a bit more thoughtful about what we're doing, how we're going to make this fair, how it's going to be administered. Um, and that doesn't mean that we shouldn't have some outdoor dining. We just need to be uh, thoughtful about it. So I'm glad we're going to have a little more time and get a little more input before we make a recommendation to the council. Thank you, Susan. Commissioner Will? Yeah, I've got a bunch of comments as well. Uh, first of all, with regards to the comments from the public, my understanding is that um, it's the, the city council is the pool, are the people who are going to decide whether or not we want outdoor dining, and, and I think that's the right place. And my where that decision to be made, and and I think all the the city outreach or rather city uh, public comments should be addressed towards the city council as to yay or nay. What should we should we continue this policy. Um, I'm, my understanding is that we've been given direction from the city council to see what we can do to move this forward. And, and so that's how I'm addressing this, that it's a, it's a decision that's been made and it's the implementation that we need to worry about. Um, with regards to the nothing burger that uh, Commissioner um, Newman mentioned about the Coastal Commission, with regards to the funds, I would think that the Coastal Commission is going to be looking at this closely. And when we put these uh, funds aside uh, for, you know, coastal access activity and whatnot, it shouldn't just be a shell game. We, we should set up this account and put in things that they will, uh, as priority, fund things that they know we know that they will appreciate, uh, as opposed to, oh, uh, we're do street cleaning. Uh, that's how we're going to spend their money, and we're going to take the rest of the money and put it in the general fund. We should be. I think we should specify what exactly these fees are going to be placed uh, to spend on um, to satisfy the coastal commission, so that they they don't think that we're just playing this silly shell game with them. Um, with regards to the design, the prototype, uh, I think. I think this is something that we'd want to reach out to the like the BIA, um, you know, that there, with regards to at least the village park parking and park list. I think these are these are people who are who get together regularly, and they talk about the village in general, and they could probably come up with some plans that it would address a lot of these issues. Um, I don't like the lottery notion. Um, I, I would rather see. Um, like a zoning or say, you know, here are the plots of, of land and here's, here's how big they are so that everybody knows these are the parklet areas. Um, but something other than the lottery process, I, I think we need to work on that. That's, that's not very good. But we definitely need a lot of public outreach for this prototype. And the reason is, is because it was mentioned by staff, the Coastal Commission is going to pre-approve a prototype, prototype design. So if some other applicant comes in and wants a different one, does that mean they got to go through the Coastal Commission? That's not going to happen. So this prototype design better be fully vetted by everybody in the community because that prototype design is what we're going to be stuck with. And um, I'm thinking that um, it, that's probably a good thing because you maybe want some continuity in, in the prototype design. So there's got to be a lot of... Uh, out, um, community outreach on this prototype design. It's not something that I would feel comfortable with approving as just a, a planning commissioner without the community behind us. Um, it was mentioned several times about how parklets have been tried before. Uh, former Mayor Norton mentioned it. I remember that uh, on uh, San Jose Street. And uh, so that brings up the question of this $3,000, $3,400 a year uh, again, I would want to go to the BIA or someone to make sure that that's 
a reasonable rent and maybe it's too little uh, maybe it's, you know but i i do recall that that was a reason that park that didn't happen in the past is because of the the rents were too high and so we, we need to consider that as well um definitely uh, um you need to worry about the safety and emissions issues uh and that might that might define where these park lifts are allowed. I mean, if there's a corner where there's a lot of traffic, um, you might want to prohibit it there because there's just too many auto emissions and the air is not breathable. And so that, you know, maybe Margaritaville or whatever doesn't get it because that's where all the cars are stalled. Point is, I don't think the lottery is the way, right way to, uh, to approach it. And that's it, I think. Thank you, Mr. Rupp. Yeah, you know, like Mr. Newman, I've probably been in Capitola now closer to 60 years than 50. And the village has always been kind of an eclectic place. You've got so many things happening down there. You've got bars, restaurants, tourism, the beach, you name it. You know, it's a place that people come to go for entertainment and, and to have fun. And for those residents that really voice concerns about the activity that causes noise in the village. I think if you move to the village expecting peace and quiet, you've moved to the wrong place. People have been complaining about noise down there for as long as I can remember. So you just can't really expect to have a quiet evening if you live in the village. It just doesn't happen, it never has, and it probably never will. Uh, I just have a couple of comments. Uh, first, I don't think Capitola Avenue should be included in the parklets. I think that's that's just a, a major street and we should limit the limit the parking spaces that are going to be converted into outdoor dining to the Esplanade and Monterey Avenue. Perhaps San Jose Avenue, but I would say definitely not Capitola Avenue. Um, and I think uh, in regards to the bicycles, I believe that's the city's responsibility to, to create a central area for park bike parking down there. They could utilize some of the Esplanade Park or some other area down there that's suitable to provide a central area for bark, bike parking rather than scattering it around to each individual site. So uh, those are my primary comments. I think it's going to be a ways to go. I think it's a good idea for as long as I can remember. There's always been a desire to close off the Esplanade entirely and, and make it into a permanent pedestrian area, uh, walkway, park, whatever you'd like to call it. But I think we're going in the right direction. I just think we need to be limited in the areas that we include and uh, be careful that they don't look tacky when it's all finished, because right now they do. Okay. So I actually concur on the idea of Capitola Avenue being eliminated. I mean, it's a major street going through there and uh, can't be a very pleasant place to sit on and eat, uh, particularly in the afternoon or evening when all the rush hour traffic is happening. And I had one question for staff because um, uh, I believe the comment was made that uh, the Coastal Commission uh, saw these uh, dining areas being open to the public and it's my understanding that um, the direction we're going in right now is that they would not be open to the public when they weren't being used for dining, um, that they were, they were going to be closed off. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. You. Sorry. Uh, that is correct. So in the beginning, they had asked us to make sure they are left open for the public after they close. Uh, we talked about the issues with vandalism and uh, they they then changed their recommendation after doing some research on other restaurants in which they had that requirement for um, and the monitoring headaches included with that so it would not be open to the public it would be open to patrons in but who could take in the views so and and i think we need to sort of address when they're going to be open and I say that because there's one down in the village right now where the business, I think, is only open three days a week. So we've 
given up a parking area for someone to um, use and it's it's really not being utilized by the business the majority of the time so i think we have to think about are we going to have requirements for when they're open how much they're used or what happens there hey katie do you need any other direction from the commission well i i did want to ask one question that i would like to see um the uh, Commissioner Westman brought up the sidewalk dining and we have combined the sidewalk dining in with the street dining. Would the Planning Commission like to see us separate that out and have a little bit like if sidewalk dining applications come to the Planning Commission as we have it drafted now it would um, only require an administrative permit. Would you like to see us set that up with different with specific standards and have those come to planning commission where there is not a prototype. I think the suggestion was also made that maybe we make a prototype for sidewalk dining and that could be approved administratively and then um, any custom designs come to planning commission similar to the dining decks. I think, I think it should be planning commission, commission issue. Commissioner Newman? I think it should be a planning commission issue for someone to utilize the public sidewalk for dining purposes. I agree. I agree. Same here. Okay. Um, and uh, Capitola Avenue, are you all in, is, does anyone, I, I've heard two people comment on Capitola Avenue and possibly taking that out of the street dining deck areas. We're moving. I agree. My comment would be um, that I would like to see a, 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 a map of the village and say, here are the areas that make sense for parklets for the following reasons, and here are the areas that are prohibited for the following reasons. And, and the reason for Capitola Avenue, I would think, would be more along the emissions issues. You don't want people breathing in exhaust. And so, you know, I, I think you need, to, you, you need to go business by business and say, what are the pluses and minuses of having a parklet here and then and then draw the map accordingly and i don't necessarily feel that capitola avenue is prohibited but um i think it needs to be considered as pluses and minuses okay and then we have three favoring prohibition and one favoring looking at it <laughs> Yeah, and I go back and I, I, I to this prototype and how it's going to be. I, I think a, a lot of questions need will be answered once we have something like that and have more information about how it's actually going to to function. Um, and I I understand that you know in a lot of cities they have limited the um, dining areas because they're not parklets anymore because they're not open to the public uh, you know they're dining decks or dining areas for the restaurants um, and a lot of cities have limited them to two spaces I think that in, in Las Gadas it says it can be the frontage of your building or up to two spaces well that doesn't really work with diagonal parking because as someone said, you know, one diagonal parking space with cars on either side of them uh, really doesn't function too well because of the angle. So, um, you know, I'd like to see us understand you have to have three spaces to make it work and have the people be able to get out of the cars on either side of the diagonal. I mean, there's just lots of questions and issues that we need some answers for before we make a recommendation. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, I guess I'm pushing for the city to move forward with, you know, they've got funds to have somebody do some design work on this for us. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think we've given Katie a lot to work with here. So uh, Katie, you don't need any action other than that direction we've given you, right? Right. No, and we I, are going to notice think, the village. I have lots of notes to work from, and I'll, <laughs> I'll I'll try to bring back revisions of those items that I think I heard some consensus on. But I think we've got 
our work cut out for us for November 4th. So I just ask okay. that it be continued. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, then that brings us to our last item tonight, okay. which is item D, and this is a presentation on nonconforming structures and permissible structural alterations. And I believe this is on the agenda at the request of Commissioner Newman. So um, actually on that last item, I, I think we do need to continue this to November 4th. I'm happy to re-notice, but uh, just so we close. I'll make a motion. I, I can make a motion to continue it to November 4th. We have a second. I, I will second it, Commissioner Newman. And then we have a motion and second to continue to the November meeting. That would be the outdoor dining and design permit ordinance. Uh, and then we have the roll call, please. Commissioner Newman. Commissioner Newman. Yes. Commissioner Westman. Yes. Commissioner Wilk. Yes. And Chair Ruth. Yes. Thank okay, you. The motion carries and that will be heard once again in the November meeting. Okay, now we're on item D, uh, the nonconforming structures. Katie? Yes. Um, is there a slide before this, Sean? Sorry. Oh, no. Okay. So in our in our code, I, I, first I want to just step back in the history of our non-conforming structures and structural alter alterations. I put kind of an in-depth history of what we went through during our zoning code update. We had drafted, and I still have, of course, um, revisions to this section of code. And in those revisions, and I, I, I apologize, I didn't attach them to the staff report, and that probably would have been better so you could have a clear reminder of the work we had done. But in the revisions, we really outlined um, how, we, how uh, different scenarios would be treated and what types of non-conforming structures could stay and in what situations um, could a non-conforming structure be rebuilt in place with the Planning Commission's approval. We have spent quite a, quite a bit of time on this and really had thoughtful discussions and put together a great ordinance that would, um, that would have been much easier for our public to understand um, in terms of, you know, you figure out where you fit within the scenarios and that's what your process was. And the Planning Commission did a great job of trying to say if, if, if the non-conforming structure is not causing an issue to a neighboring structure and not having an impact, then it could probably, you know, it can continue to stay in its place. So, but as we went through this process, um, and going to the Coastal Commission, they had drafted new guidance on um, sea level rise and specific, and in that guidance was specific um, guidance for single, for residential structures um, along the coastline in the coastal zone and how to calculate um, permiss permissible structural alterations. And they wanted to go back um, through permitting it back to when the Coastal Act came into being and um, cumulatively add all of those, uh, all of the investments that a property owner had put together over time. And once you've hit 50%, you could no longer protect your structure. And it was essentially um, just trying to force property owners to once, once they've, to, to no longer be able to reinvest into their properties um, due to sea level rise. So there's a lot of work to be done at the state level on that. I, I went down and um, went to one of the sea level rise discussions on this and the commission had directed staff to continue to work on the um, policy document. Nothing has been adopted at this point. I think with COVID, the focus has changed. Um, when I've reached out to the uh, Coastal Commission, they've told me that you know nothing has happened since that last meeting where many different cities came in and spoke against their policy document. So what we have is the old um, ordinance that was in place um, and it is quite confusing the language of it. Um, so this is section 17.92070. 
I'm not going to read this to you. I'm going to ask Sean to go to the next slide where I try to simplify what this says. Um, and what it is saying is that if you add together the cost of new improvements and the cost of improvements over the past five years, and you take the um, present fair market value of the existing structure, if the cost of the new improvements plus the cost of improvements over the past five years is less than 80% of the, fair, the present fair market value of the structure, then we can go ahead and permit the, the project. Next slide, please. Oh, if it is more than the 80% of the present fair market value when you add those two together, then we cannot permit, and they've got to bring the whole project into compliance with, typically it's your setbacks um, for non-conforming structures. Um, so at that point, they would have to bring the whole structure into compliance if they wanted to. So how, I, I, I ran through a few examples. Next slide, please. Um, well, first I should say that the non-conforming, the um, valuations are all based on valuations that our building official adopts, and it comes out through the building code. So in talking with uh, Robin Woodman, our building official, she did say it's probably time for us to increase these a little bit, but it's, it's based on um, building code. They seem uh, much less than, you know, what any of us would pay right now to have an addition put on our house, but this is the valuations that they have in place. They're, they're actually not that far off from these numbers. I looked at them recently. Um, next slide, please. So with the three examples, I looked at um, a thousand square foot home that has a 200 square foot garage and a 100 square foot deck. Next slide. In the first example, I, um, just, I, I ran through the numbers of a just complete remodel. So they would remodel the 1,000 square foot home, the 200 square foot garage, and the 100 square foot deck. At that point, their calculation would be 50% of existing value. So you, you could totally remodel your non-conforming structure under today's code. Next slide, please. Under scenario two, this is one that we see quite often, uh, the property owner could remodel their entire home and then add a 33% addition and not have to come into compliance with the code. The addition would have to be located so that it complies with the zoning code, so it would have to meet all setbacks and height and all development standards, uh, parking. Next slide, please. And lastly, um, the third scenario shows no remodel, but an 80% increase in the square footage of the home, and that's where um, you max out at that 80% valuation. So if you're proposing an addition and not doing any um, remodeling of your home, you could do up to an 80% addition. The, in looking at how this is structured, it's all based on ratios and percentages. Um, so therefore, there's an advantage to having a large home and applying this, or this ordinance versus if you had a really small home and wanted to do a large addition, you couldn't go beyond 80% of the size of your home. So um, at, you know, for a 500 square foot home, it would have a greater impact than a 1,000 square foot home where you could get twice as much of the square footage. So a 500 square foot home could get a 400 square foot um, addition and not be max and would be maxed out but a thousand square foot home could get up to an 800 square foot addition so there is some level of uh, fairness that is not across the board with the way the ordinance is written um, so I just wanted to provide an overview um, as requested by Commissioner Newman um, in discussing this if th there is the option that I could bring back the draft ordinance that we worked on previously, and it could be adopted to apply outside of the coastal zone if you would like. Um, we could also take another run at it to the Coastal Commission, but I think we should, at this point, we've got a few items um, ahead of this in terms of, you know, right now the outdoor dining, as well as we've got our objective design standards. So it's something I could put on our list, but it likely would not 
move forward till probably uh, end of summer. And at that point, we should really get into a discussion on probably sea level rise and seeing if we can make some um, specific criteria along our bluffs and close to the water. And I do think that that deserves uh, a very uh, interactive process with the public. It's something really important to our citizens and being a coastal community. So um, we, we could bring it forth in the near future to be adopted outside of the coastal zone. But if we want to have it inside the coastal zone, we've got, a, we've got our, some work to do to get it to a point that in working with the Coastal Commission. So with that, that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, you know, it appears that property values have so far outpaced construction costs as they're shown in the ordinance. It's rendered this ordinance kind of meaningless. I, I've just looked at my own house, for example. It has a value of probably 1.3 to 1.6 million. That means I could I could do over a million dollars of improvements before I hit the 80% level. I have a two foot setback in the backyard and a two foot setback on the side yard, on one side. So I could I could completely rebuild my house on a new house with the same footprint, expand over into the other side yard because I have more than adequate setbacks there and still not meet the 80%. So I don't I don't see that this ordinance and its current configuration really accomplishes anything. So other comments from the commissioners? Go ahead, Mr. Newman. So I, um, I, I thought we got blindsided on this because we spent so much time and one of the best things I thought we did in the process of the new zoning ordinance was and we was dealing with this uh, non-conforming uh, structure part of the ordinance and we came up with something that I thought was so much uh, more simpler more understandable and advanced the policy that we thought was most important which was that we encouraged, given what the, the nature of Capitola and all the non-conforming buildings, that we encouraged people to improve their property over trying to bring them into conformity. And that was the policy kind of decision behind the new version of the ordinance. And somehow, I guess, through the Coastal Commission process, it just got completely tanked. And uh, that's very disappointing to me because I think it was much better. And I think the best, Katie and I talked about this earlier today and she didn't mention it yet. The, you know, the best solution might be just to carve out the bluff houses for the Coastal Commission because that's what they're really concerned about and apply a special rule to houses on the bluff and then keep the ordinance that we developed when we developed the new zoning code for the rest of the city. That's what I would like to see. Yeah, I didn't think it was just the houses on the bluff they were concerned about. I thought that their coastal rise concerns like covered all of the properties in the village, the properties coming up Soquel Creek and a number of er other areas, not just the bluff. So, I mean, you so could in, do it in the area. Go ahead, Susan. I'm sorry. You could do it in the area outside the coastal zone. That's a lot of Capitola is in the coastal zone. Yeah. So, Ed, was your purpose just to address the homes on the bluff to to protect them from having major changes, or what was the purpose? The, the purpose is just to, to get the Coastal Commission to allow us to implement the new ordinance provision that we developed. But I'm trying, I was trying to figure out what, what, you know, what dog they had in this fight. What, what was their problem with it? And I'm still not clear on that. Uh, and what coastal policy is being advanced by basically um, you know, torpedoing our new ordinance that we developed. Okay. Okay. Where do we go from here? 
Well, well, Susan said Susan says that the uh, Coastal Commission concern is broader than just the bluff houses, and I, I mean, maybe we can figure out exactly what um, what portion of the coastal zone it is important to them to control the non-conforming uh, rule and carve out that uh, just that area. Right. I, I I thought that this got pulled out because at the time the Coastal Commission has a policy which they have adopted, which isn't law, but it was their policy that they said to us, which basically meant that homes that they thought were ultimately going to be impacted by sea level rise um, really couldn't do any major improvements or modifications to their home. And their goal was to have those homes ultimately all go away. And it did impact, you know, a significant portion of Capitola, I know, you know, including the Capitola village itself. So I think we should find out, you know, where the Coastal Commission is. Um, as Katie said, she went to one meeting. Um, uh, I don't think they've done anything in this area for a while, but, but we should find out what's going on in that arena and then decide how we want to proceed. Yes, if, if that's their purpose, then going back to our old ordinance doesn't really advance it very well either. Right, but they said they if we tried to change it, they would require you know, this new criteria. So, I mean, I agree with you. I think the ordinance, this is a very sort of antiquated, odd way of dealing with non-conforming. The, the new ordinance would be much better. It's just sort of a stalemate between, uh, you know, the Coastal Commission and a number of jurisdictions right now, not just Capitola. Yeah, I think the the purpose behind the Coastal Commission was really geared towards retreat and, and not rebuilding in areas where you're, you know, where we're expected to get more and more intense storms and uh, sea level rise. So yes, the areas in the village, the low areas would also be impacted. And essentially once you've, it, it's at, it's, the policy was to not um, allow improvements beyond 50% of the value of your home backtracking to the 1970s. Um, and then you, you can't, uh, if you have put in more money than that, then you're not allowed to protect your home. So it was just, it's really towards coastal retreat um, and allowing, you know, to plan for sea level rise. But when we did submit our, our first draft to the Coastal Commission, they came back and gave me a version, a, a red line version that they had given, uh, created for Marin County, which really has no, there's no parallel between our, you know, really dense village um, and Marin County and the, you know, their ability to retreat is much higher than any of our, you know, our six sisters. And so maybe what we should do here, since we have a couple of big items that we need to take care of first, mm -hmm. is table this for, till we get those items completed and then by that time, maybe the Coastal Commission will have uh, provided more guidance on this issue, and we can develop some kind of uh, modification to our proposed new new provisions. Makes good sense to me. Yeah, I think that's the avenue we probably have to take. All right, thank you. So shall we leave? this item at that with that kind of determination and leave it to Katie to bring this back at an appropriate time when she doesn't have so much on her plate. <laughs> Agreed. Okay. If that meets the consensus of the commission then, I don't believe this takes any action. We'll move on to the director's report. Do we have a report tonight, Katie? There's, um, I, I actually just have one item to bring up tonight. Um, 
I just wanted to let you know that Edna Basso, who's been very helpful, she actually, as our um, taking our minutes at our planning commission meetings and a uh, great employee to be working with, she actually got a, a very good opportunity, which she cannot turn down because it's right, right up her alley in terms of what her mission is in life. And um, so I'm really happy for her. At the same time, there'll be a loss. Um, <laughs> For us, I think Chloe's going to help us out at the next meeting, but we are going to be hiring for a development service tech and an assistant clerk. Um, but I just wanted to extend my thanks to Edna. She's here tonight and she's just been an asset to our team. And she also helped roll out the economic development grant. She was very instrumental in that and is just a go getter. The minute you ask uh, a favor, she gets the work done and she does it um, meticulously. So. City's lost, but she's uh, she's got a great opportunity, so I congratulate her and just wanted to let you all know. So this is oh, her good. last meeting this evening. Well, thank, thank you, you Edna, Edna, for your thank you, Edna, all your help with Capitola. And good luck in your new uh, new position. Okay. Any commission communications? Just one. I'd like to thank Kingston Rivera, our technician tonight for sticking with us and broadcasting this. Uh, if there's nothing else, we'll adjourn the meeting to our next regularly scheduled meeting in November. Thank you. Good night, Good night everyone. Everybody. Thank you. Good night. Goodbye. <laughs>